Now let's get back to get back to South Africa. This is what it looked like um, around that time, um, from the 1850s onwards. Um, so who knows where who knows where Kimberley is? I mean, I mean, so it's, it's near. I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly, but it's on. It's on the kind of border between here, which you see the Orange Free State, and the Cape Colony. And obviously, um, the Vlaams Trans in Joburg, and that's up in the Transvaal. Um, so, what are the key? The key to what I'm getting to is that these huge discovery of minerals were. They weren't in the British controlled areas who had interests in mine and had the an economy advanced enough to take advantage of mines. It was in the Boer Republics. And the economy of the Boer Republics was almost exclusively based on what? It was based on farming. Farming. It was a farming farming economy. People who haven't talked, I'm gonna like start picking on them. Because that's how we do it. Um, I think uh, before before the discovery of, of minerals in South Africa, the almost the entire economy was based on on agriculture and certain kinds of trades around the, the coastal areas. Um, but what I why I make the distinction between the the Boer states and the British states is that the British economy was sophisticated and powerful enough that if they could get access to those minerals, they could use them. And with the Boer states, that was, that was different, because there were, in those areas, a small number of people and mostly sticking to farming. Uh, the Orange Free State and the Transvaal. The Orange Free State and the Transvaal were independent states, governed by <coughs> residents of the Fort Trek who left the Cape Colony and then Nassau to escape British rule. The British controlled almost all of the surrounding the Republicans and the massive appetite for gold to improve their living and stabilize their financial institutions to use and their watches. They saw some funding and militarism. So that's just building on what I was saying earlier, where um, the Boer states didn't have much, didn't have a great deal of use for for gold. Farming economy, you don't you don't really need that much capital. You don't need that much, uh, and they weren't interested in in military. You know, they weren't interested in, interested in expanding further into the into the continent. So they didn't. They weren't looking for a great deal of gold to spend on arms. Um, and the contrast is here with the, with the British economy. Um, as, it, as it explains, has have several uses for for uh, huge stockpiles of, of gold. Um, this guy is Paul. Paul um, it's spelled Kruger, but it's it's pronounced Kreer, which is a difference between the Afrikaans in the High Felt and down by the coast. It's Paul Kruger. Um, any other? I'm gonna stop like every. Who is this guy? He was the president. He was the president of the the transfer. Uh, he was the president of one of the board, one of the two board members. So now, so now, we'll, let's go back to this for um, this for a second. The British are all around, and they have a lot of views for gold. But now, uh, where is where is the gold being discovered? <coughs> inside, inside the uh, diamonds and diamonds in Kimberley and the, the gold in the, in the Vitwatershrand. It's inside the Boer territory. Yeah. It's going to lead to to a fight. Yeah. So that's what we that's what we're going to talk about. Well, the tension between the Boers and the British. At first, uh, there was no serious conflict between the Boers, the public, and the British. The British owned funds were able to operate in the the vet the waterland and the empire and the empire got its gold. However, 
labor intensive, deep labor mining became necessary in the 1890s to access the great seams um, of the deep water strand. Cost began to rise rapidly in the big mining houses, same as today, De Beers and the Godfield began to demand a far greater level of, um, of state support than ever before, but the bull republics mm -hmm. couldn't supply it. So, is the relationship between the, between the economy of a certain country and the state in a certain country? If your country's economy is based entirely on agriculture, that industry requires certain types of, of support from the state. Right? If your economy is based on mining and manufacturing and different kinds of things, it requires different kinds of support. Right? That's, that's, that's logical. Um, so the point that this is making is that the goal in the Vitvata Strand is, especially it's like um, compared to gold uh, reserves in other countries is extra deep below the surface of the earth and as such requires that it's you know the labor you need a lot more labor to get it out um, which means that you're paying more workers and so your costs as you go deeper and deeper and deeper you need more workers and your costs begin to rise and you know that if you're a business and your costs begin to rise then that's, that's going to become a problem at times um, the companies wanted support from the poor states, and as I've explained, the states were mostly geared around supporting agriculture, and they couldn't, they didn't have the skills, this government, because I mean, the government at the end of the day needs skills, it needs capacity. We know in the areas that we work that, for example, our government isn't particularly good at providing services, right? This was the same problem that these big mining firms were running into with the Boer Republics. They couldn't provide the companies with the services that they needed to do this mining as profitably as they wanted it to be done. Um, so I've kind of, I've kind of half answered these questions, but I'm going to move on because we'll get deeper into it now. As mentioned about the pre-mineral revolution economy was really like relied almost entirely on agriculture and had no mining or manufacturing industries. I'm posing a question. What, and when we refer to these industries, we're talking about mining and manufacturing. What do the industries need to function profitably? Throw out some ideas. What do these industries need to function in particular? Uh, labor. Yeah. Labor. Uh, the machines. Okay. The land. What do you need to get machines? What do you need to get land? Machines. Need to have more uh, people that uh, have those machines. They need to negotiate the price, they may have to go to that uh, thing, they have this cognitive side, cheap labor, labor, so we can introduce and get that profit, uh, profit uh, But when you're talking about negotiating about a price, at the end of the day, you need to pay that price, you need capital. Yes. Labor, you need capital to access the land of the machine. Sorry, are you okay? Less than Less skilled labor. <laughs> what do you mean? Uh, what do you mean? We're going to go into that soon. I mean that they, they must uh, have more labor that are less skilled so that they can pay the less in case in terms of they can make more profit. So that's something to add to the point about labor. You need cheap labor. Yeah. Especially like when we've said that these mines, the gold is especially deep below the ground. You need lots of workers and therefore you want to pay them less. So to add to labor, cheap labor, capital. And people to operate the because as, as much as you need low skilled labor, you're also gonna need 
certain levels of, of high school as well. Um, sorry? Okay, we'll get there. We'll give you some time to think about it. And then and then kind of holding it all holding all of this together, you need a you need quite a strong functioning state. You need a judiciary, you need a a bureaucracy to kind of to manage the affairs of the state, you need a police force, you need all of these kinds of things which, if you've been a state completely concerned with farming, which is, you know, out in, out in rural areas and isn't centralized into big, you know, because, uh, you know, for a mining labor force and a manufacturing labor force, they need to be in, in one place. So suddenly there's these, these poor states are dealing with large concentrations of people and they, don't, they just don't have the experience or the skills to provide policing, to provide a functioning judiciary. There's a lot of, you find that there's a lot of corruption, a lot of incompetence, mismanagement. And all of this, at the end of the day, was costing these companies money. These companies are from Britain, and at the end of the day, the British state is, is profiting as well by drawing tax out of these companies, by bringing that kind of wealth into the economies. It's good for that empire. So when they see, oh, so, so when their, their firms in, in this country, in these poor republics, are struggling to produce profitably under these conditions, those firms start to put pressure on the British state to come in and do something about it. Um, and if you think about the, the context of this, uh, of this time where countries are just, European powers are just simply grabbing land from people especially in Africa, but in other places around the world as well. Yeah, I mean, today, if Britain came to South Africa and just like took it over, it would be, it would be an international outcry. Now we have an army that would be much more difficult. But back then, things were, things were different, and they could actually try and make this kind of intervention. Now, of these different, of these different things that the, these, these firms needed, Cheap labor, firstly, and cheap labor, secondly, was the most Im important to ensure that they ran profitably, right? And there are two different parts. I mean, there are many different parts, but in, in what we'll do today, we're going to look at two different parts of the labor problem. Um, firstly, there are many firms trying to take advantage of the gold and the diamonds in these areas. But at this time, there was still a limited number of people willing to go into those mines and work those incredibly dangerous, poorly paid, um, I mean, exploitative, abusive jobs, right? There was just um, not as many. Um, and when you have, let's say, okay, well, let's think about it. Let's say you guys on this side of the table are each a mining company. And this is your this is your pool of labor, and you all need many workers, and you need to pay them as little as possible. But there's a limited pool of them. Let's say you offer these two five rand an hour, and they come to work for you. But then Face needs extra workers to add to his two, so he says, okay, well, if you come to me, I'll offer you five rand five rand fifty. Suddenly, you've lost your workers, right? To get your workers back, what do you have to do? You're going to have to pay them. You're going to have to pay them more, and the, this competition would happen between all of you for this limited number of workers. And the net result is that the price of labor increases. At this stage, there was still quite a large population of Black South African communities and societies who didn't have to work for a wage to survive. They didn't have to go into the mines to survive. And if you, if you can live your life independently, how you've always lived it with your family, why would you go to the mines for, for peanuts? Why? You, you wouldn't, right? Um, is, that, is that, I mean, that's, that's quite straightforward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I mean, today, today we have a slightly d different situation. Now we have 
more people looking for jobs than the companies want to employ, and that's a different kind of problem. So, what we to just keep in the back of your mind? We're not going to deal with it today, but just that the the economy since then has changed in a huge number of ways. Um, but these are the two. These are the two basic parts of the the labour problem that we're going to deal with. Today.